Well, after a 16-day partial government shutdown, a stopgap measure was agreed to. At the helm of those negotiations, the man who has emerged as the key Republican player in this national stage, U.S. Senator Mitch McConnell. But the bigger question is, now what? Well, we're going to find out as we welcome to the program U.S. Senator Mitch McConnell when Kentucky Outlook comes your way next. Stay with us. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Kentucky Outlook. I'm Barbara Deeb. We're glad you joined us. Kentucky's senior senator, Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, has once again graced the national political stage, choosing pragmatism over ideology to play a role in brokering an agreement to reopen the federal government. And depending on who you talk to, it was, as Mitch McConnell often does, very masterful or a betrayal. You decide as we enjoy a conversation with U.S. Senator Mitch McConnell. Always a pleasure to have you here. I choose masterful. I, I knew you would. I knew you would. We gave you the option. And if you read some of these reviews, Mort Kondracki, you know, talking about what a statesman you are, stepping up. As we stand, there is a stopgap measure, federal government's rolling again, but the big question is, now what? Well, <clears throat> Let, let me go back and review what happened. There was a strategy employed by House Republicans that had no chance of success, which was that we would threaten to shut down the government if they wouldn't defund Obamacare. Well, look, all Republicans <coughs> think Obamacare is a terrible bill and ought to be replaced. But there's a math problem. In the Senate, I'm the leader of the minority, not the leader of the majority. There are 55 of them and 45 of us. And oh, by the way, the President of the United States thinks it's the most wonderful thing he ever did. So they're not going to defund Obamacare. So it was a flawed strategy. Even though we all agree on my side of the aisle that it was a terrible law and ought to be repealed, we don't have the votes to do it. And so we reached the point during the government shutdown where I thought it was important to step up and pull the country back from the brink we had a 16-day shutdown, and we had the, uh, the, the debt ceiling and the potential default Approaching. 24 hours later, and it seemed to me it was time for some adult leadership, if you might, to pull the country back from the brink and get us back on the right path. And we did that. I was proud to do it. Make no apologies for doing it. It was the right thing to do for the country. And in terms of your question, where do we go now, there are two things that have been done during the Obama years that I think have worked well for the country. I happen to have been involved in those as well, negotiations with the Vice President Joe Biden, which gave us 99 percent of the Bush tax cuts, permanent law so they don't expire, a bill called the Budget Control Act, mm -hmm. which has actually reduced government spending for two years in a row for the first time since right after the Korean War. So we're reducing government spending, and we have permanent tax relief for 99% of Kentuckians. I don't want to undo that. In other words, I don't want to bust out of either of those deals. Yeah. Our friends on the other side of the aisle, including the President of the United States, want to raise taxes and want to increase spending. So I think that's the core issue, Barb, that <clears throat> we should have been dealing with the last few weeks and we'll be dealing with again in January and February. Now, I can confidently say we're not going to shut the government down and we're not going to default so people don't have to worry about that. Again, again, we're not going to well, shut the government down Well, you know, one of my again. old favorite Kentucky sayings is there's no education the second kick of a mule. We tried that back in the 90s. It didn't work well for my party then. It didn't work well once again. <clears throat> so look, it's a strategy that can't work. But that obscures the larger issue. We have a $17 trillion cumulative national debt. That's as big as our economy. That makes us look a lot like a Western European country. The last thing we want to do is start spending more again. We need to be spending less. And so when we go into these uh, discussions in January and February, first with the government operation and second with the debt ceiling, <clears throat> in my view, at the very least, we don't want to raise taxes and increase spending. And I hope that uh, that's what we'll be able to get 
our friends on the other side to agree to. Now, January, what you're referencing is the fact that this stopgap measure yeah. takes us through to January. So we've yeah, got I had a pretty then. weak hand in this negotiation. I used a football <clears throat> terminology. I was on my own two-yard line. The offensive line was breaking down, but and I, I was hoping to get off a punt to get into a better position. You were obviously not a football fan, boy. I, I am, but you you waited. It's almost as if uh, it was in the 11th hour. Oh, I didn't wait. What I was waiting on was to see if the House could pass something, and the House was unable to pass anything. So and when the Speaker came into my office last week and said, we're not going to be able to send you anything, at that point we were in the 11th hour. Mm -hmm. Remember, I'm the leader of the minority. The initial negotiation was between the majority and the House, led by the Speaker, and the majority in the Senate. When the majority in the House was not able to send something over, that left it up to me to try to do the best I could with the Democratic majority in the Senate and get the government out of the shutdown. So I wasn't waiting around. I was waiting for the House to act, and they couldn't. And when the Speaker made it clear that they couldn't, then I was kind of the... Uh, the stop you gap. were the man. You were the man. <laughs> Harry Reid, too, was quite generous in his support of you. Yeah, and well, you know, that's a mixed bag. <laughs> <laughs> it is. And I ruined your football <laughs> analogy. But I get what you were saying. Yeah. You, you were waiting there to make sure. Well, you, you know, I thought it was time for some adult leadership to get us out of the, uh, the shutdown, which was not good for the country, and to get back on track. And it, I was pleased to do it and would do it again if I'm in a similar situation. Well now as we speak, as we're recording this program today before the House Energy and Commerce Committee, they're taking a look at the, what's the nice word I can use, the implementation glitches that are occurring with Obamacare. Yeah. So they're, they're bringing it to committee, they're hoping maybe to get Kathleen Sebelius to present. Do you think that's a waste of energy? No, it's a huge and important issue. Look, Obamacare is the worst piece of legislation that's been passed in the last half century. The single biggest step in the direction of Europeanizing the country. It's costing jobs. It's driving premiums up. People are losing the health care that they have and like. Everything it was sold to do is not coming true. And had we not <coughs> been off on this uh, shut down the government scenario, we'd have been talking about this several weeks ago as it began to roll out. October 1st. Well, now we're back on a very, very important subject for the country. And interestingly enough, the day you and I are taping this, Democrats are beginning to crack. Uh, two of them just today uh, called for delay in the individual mandate, something they were not willing to do two weeks ago. Um, <clears throat> I don't think this can possibly work, but the only way it changes in the short term is if Democrats decide, wait, wait, wait a minute, this is not turning out the way I had hoped. And if they join us, then I think we can delay certain parts of it. It would still be my preference to repeal it, but I'm not the leader of the majority. I wish I were. I wish we had a president who had a similar view. But in the meantime, it's going to require Democrats basically giving up on portions of it. And I think we're going to see that begin to happen. But, but have we given it enough time? You know, this is just the rollout, and, and apparently the, the rollout has seen a lot of glitches. Can I address I mean, that? In general, it's yeah. been three years since the bill passed. People don't three see it as years such. Three years? Yeah. To, to get a website that's remotely accessible? But let's assume they soon, sooner or later get the website problem fixed. Then the question is, what do you get when you get on there? A constituent of mine in Bowling Green wrote, she was able to finally get on there, and she found out that she had very few choices and the prices were higher than what she had now. So even if they can somehow finally figure out how to have an accessible website, the question is, what do you get? What do you get when, when you, you get, get there? there? Now, Kentucky's been lauded for its uh, rollout mm -hmm. of the Affordable Care Act, I mean, that it's been doing with these well, health Well, they've been able, apparently mm -hmm. they've been able to get more people to access the website in Kentucky, but it remains the question as my constituent from Bowling Green pointed out, she got on, but what did she get? What do you get when you get there? You know, you've been doing this a while, we've been doing this a while, but what you've seen, what you've just come through, this mm -hmm. saga, is it different than what you've experienced in the past or is it just the same business as usual? Well, we had a similar experience in the 90s and um, unfortunately, I think a lot of the new <coughs> newer members didn't remember that or 
Look, Americans don't want the government shut down. They, they think that's an irresponsible act. And, and frankly, it is. It is. Yeah, there's, there's no reason to do that. We can have a civil debate about the future of the country without engaging in what are viewed by the American people as extreme measures. So that isn't going to happen again. And we are going to get back on the subject, which is spending and debt and Obamacare. And Obamacare is a huge issue. I'm glad the House is having the hearings. We ought to be having those hearings in the Senate as well. But the Senate's run by Democrats who are having a hard time giving up on it, you know. They've been, they've been told by the President <clears throat> three years ago this is going to be wonderful. They keep waiting for it to be wonderful. Well, it isn't wonderful. It's not going to get wonderful. And look, we are not insulated from our constituents. Democrats have constituents too, and they're beginning sure. to complain about it. And that's why I think you're beginning to see cracks in the dike. And there are going to be changes because this cannot work. Cracks in the dike, and you reference cracks, some of the Democrats are starting to crack. Mm -hmm. But what did all of this that you, we've just come through, what has that done to the Republican Party? Well, it hadn't been good. I mean, our, our no. favorability is uh, at a 25-year low as a result of doing it. Uh, I was saying publicly back in July, this is a strategy that cannot work and will not work. And it didn't. And I'm not just bringing it up to say I told you so. It was pretty apparent to anybody who would lived through the 95 experience that this was not something the American people were going to welcome, that they would think was a responsible way to have a national debate. And so we're not doing that again. And I think the people who, uh, who orchestrated it understand that we're not doing that again. But within the party, even mm -hmm. in the Republican House and the Senate, there mm -hmm. seems to be discord. Well, there's a, there's a debate over tactics, over tactics. There are some members, a few in my, in the Senate and more in the House, who thought this was a good tactic. That surely, surely, if you threaten to shut down the government, the Democrats would say, I give up. Oh, well, I think it was entirely predictable that a group of people who thought this was a great idea are not going to roll over and give up. So that was a flawed strategy, and we have an argument over strategy, but we don't have an argument over the appropriateness of Obamacare. Every single Republican in the House and Senate voted against it. Every single Republican <coughs> in the House and Senate recently voted to defund it, but there are not enough of us to do that. So do what you have to do is learn to live with the government you have rather than the one you wish you had. I mean, I, I'd love to be the majority leader, but I'm not. I wish Mitt Romney had won, but he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> we have to deal right. with the government the American people elected. And right now, you have too many Democrats committed to this. But as I just told you earlier, they're beginning to crack. They realize it's not working. And I think there are going to be some significant changes. OK, short of taking it off the table, OK, mm -hmm. let's say we could do that. Mm -hmm. What's a better plan? What, what's a better way to address this? Let me tell you what I would have done. This. Rather than pass a 2,700-page bill backed up by 20,000 pages of regulations, and these are just the first mm -hmm. regulations, rather than taking a trillion dollars out of health care providers, hospitals, hospice, nursing homes, home health care, and the like, rather than raising taxes on medical devices and raising taxes on health insurance premiums and having the Congressional Research Service, which is a completely objective agency, say when all of this is implemented, there'll still be 30 million uninsured. Rather than doing that, where the cost-benefit ratio is not clear, not apparent, I would have started by doing this. Right now, health care is sold in 50 separate silos. We ought to have a national health insurance market. Pit all of the health insurance companies against each other in a competitive model, use the forces of competition to drive prices down and quality up. Let me give you an example in healthcare delivery of how that's been done and how it worked. Ten years ago, we added a prescription drug benefit mm -hmm. to Medicare mm -hmm. called Medicare Part D. We created a competitive market and pitted all the pharmaceutical companies against each other and amazingly enough, it is the only federal program that anybody can think of that's come in under budget. That's what we should have done with health insurance. It might not have gotten every single American insured, but Obamacare isn't going to either. Do you think it will implode on its own? Yes, I do. 
So you don't even have to do anything, just let it well, roll out it, and Well, it'll have to be undone legislatively. And the Democrats, I don't think, at any point are going to stand up and say, oops, that was a huge mistake, let's get rid of it. I do think <clears throat> they're going to com be complicit with us in picking it apart piece by piece as their constituents actually demand it. And so it will morph into something as it goes and then eventually just go away? Unless we have the American people elect a different government, in which case we'll get rid of it entirely. You want to talk dollars and cents. You're talking about a budget deficit overspending, crisis-driven fiscal policy. Is that what we want to call it? Well, it, the main reason we have the deficit is not because of crisis-driven fiscal policy. It's but that's what we're dealing with now. Well, it's because of things like the trillion-dollar stimulus, yeah. uh, Obamacare. I mean, we've added, Barb, look at it this way. We've added more debt during the Obama years than all the presidents from George Washington down to George Bush. That's extravagant spending. And it's not because of an, an absence of or inadequate taxation. We've been on a spending binge that needs to come to a halt. And I, getting this ship turned around when you have a president and still a Senate that basically like the direction has been very challenging. The other thing that's created this slow economy, which of course depresses government revenue. I mean, the slower the growth, the less revenue government gets. This is the most tepid recovery after a deep recession since World War II. Usually the pattern has been, actually every time the pattern's been, the deeper the recession, the quicker the bounce back, right. until this one. So you have to ask yourself, why has the economy not bounced back after 2008? The answer, the government itself. Obamacare, Dodd-Frank, which is Obamacare for banks, 150,000 new bureaucrats. Look at what EPA has done to the coal industry. We have a depression in eastern Kentucky, not a recession, a depression and created by EPA. They, they're in the process of issuing a regulation right now, which if it becomes final, will guarantee that there's never another new coal-fired generation plant built in America. Not one. Never. Never. So that's what they're up to. And all of that has a very depressing effect on the economy. There's an army of bureaucrats who believe that if you're making a profit, you're up to no good. You must be cheating your customers, mistreating your employees, and they're here to help you. So this oppressive bureaucracy is sort of like putting a bit, big wet blanket over the economy and say, get out there and grow. It's been very hard to grow with this kind of environment. Well, but we need to grow. We've got to grow. We need to quit doing what we're doing. Quit okay. borrowing, quit spending, quit over-regulating, quit threatening to raise taxes, and let the private sector do what it does best, which is to grow and create jobs and opportunity for our people. Where are those jobs going to be? I heard recently, um, uh, uh, she's from Washington, D.C., runs the manufacturing uh, sector there, uh, organization. She was talking about the changing face of manufacturing jobs, mm -hmm. that it just seems like we haven't gotten it yet, that we have to change the way we do business. Well, I'll tell you where the jobs are going to be. If you look inside America, the jobs are going to be in the states that are most competitive, Texas. Every ten, year we, 10 years we take a census. We find out who's growing and who isn't. Right. Texas was the only state in America with four new congressmen. How did they do it? No income tax, no estate tax, tort reform, right to work. Texas has a competitive pro-business environment. So let's go to the nation. We're in a global economy now. We ought to want America to be the best place in the world to do business. But when you have an administration, national administration, that acts more like California and less like Texas, then people begin to get the view that this isn't the best place in the world to do business. It's a competitive global economy. Jobs will go to the places Amazing. where they can be created. And so we've sort of lost sight as if we had an entitlement here to be the best country in the world. There's no entitlement. You have to keep gaining it. You have to keep earning it. And maintaining it. And maintaining it. But we've lost some of that footing on the world stage. We have. And I, I think a, a, an oppressive government with anti-business policies has a lot to do with that. 
Some of our greatest businesses are big businesses. We have a lot of wonderful small businesses too, but let mm -hmm. me just take the medical device tax, for example. The medical device manufacturing industry, some of which is all over the country, is one of our best, most productive industries. You know, making things like stents, all the devices that are used to help us live longer. A number of these companies are quite large. As a result of the medical device tax, some of those jobs are going offshore because they also operate around the world. Okay. So you can't <clears throat> engage in anti-business activities here and not have an impact. As a result of Obamacare, for example, another part of Obamacare, we have a record number of part-time jobs. People are trying to get below the 50 employer threshold. As a result of the medical device tax, the big companies are having to export jobs to other countries where it's a more business-friendly environment. We need to have Amer an America that has a kind of, shall I say, Texas kind of attitude about how you create jobs and opportunity. Government policy has a huge impact on that. Jobs, taking them elsewhere. But I also want to look at uh, what's happening on the international scene. Mm -hmm. We've had a lot going on with Syria. I heard yesterday a reference to, is Afghanistan going to be the new Vietnam? You know, uh, we have uh, Amnesty International looking at war crimes as it relates to U.S. drone activity. Mm -hmm. Where are we at on all of that? Well, we're, we're leaving Afghanistan, according to the President. So um, I do worry that if we leave no units at all there, no, no deployment at all there, <clears throat> you could have very much a rebirth of the environment in Afghanistan that led to the uh, attacks we had 9-11. Uh, Most of the military people feel that we ought to leave at least some deployment there for counterterrorism purposes. Um, I hope that's what the President in the end decides to do. But the major deployment there is coming to an end. And um, we've um, pulled back a lot of places. Yeah, but, I mean, do we need a definite we're out of their date, or do we need to stay? I, I'm not somebody who thinks it's a great <laughs> idea to give your enemies a date after which you're leaving. Um, I think a, a clearer message to the elements that have operated out there, and by the way, they can move around. A lot of the terrorists have now gone to Africa. Right, right. And many of them are in Syria. You know, it, it, the, the, the terrorism era <clears throat> is doubly complicated. It almost makes you yearn for the Cold War. <laughs> right, when it was <coughs> You knew who the good face. guys were, you knew yeah. who the bad guys were, and they were countries. They were countries. It was an entity there with which you could either go to war or you could negotiate. It, it, terrorism is not a country. You know, it's, it's kind of a mobile force of fanatics. And, um, you know, they hate modernity. They hate the U.S., they hate Israel. Actually, hate a lot of Arab regimes, too. I mean, th these are... They hate, Yeah, people period. motivated by... <clears throat> by um, bad design. And um, so it, I think counterterrorism is going to be <clears throat> a very important part of the future, having units that can deal with this kind of fanaticism. Mm -hmm. And they're going to have, many of them are going to have to be forward deployed. And I think that's a, a, a good reason to leave at least some residual component in Afghanistan. Syria and yeah. destroying their chemical weapons yeah. and their ability to make these chemical weapons. Good idea? Yeah, is it sure. is it going to make a difference, really? Well, 100,000 people have been killed there by conventional weapons. <clears throat> but do I think it's a good idea to get chemical get rid of chemical weapons? Well, you course. bet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You bet. And I, I think, um, I'm sure it was embarrassing for the president that the Russians had to broker the deal. But embarrassment aside, <clears throat> if they can... Um, locate, remove, and destroy those, that'll be a good thing for the, for the area and for, for the world. I might just say, getting rid of chemical weapons is easier said than done. You know, we have a As store of them in, yes. in uh, Richmond, Kentucky, that we've been working on for 25 years, and there's no civil war going on. In right, other I words, had a guest in here recently, and he's an expert there, and he, he thinks within uh, five years they'll have them out of there. Well, we're not moving them out. We're destroying them destroying. on site. Mm -hmm. I think what they're going to do in Syria <coughs> is rem remove them. Uh, exactly where they're going to be destroyed, I don't know. Look, that's good. 
But if the end result of that is Assad is still in power and the civil war is still raging and they're killing each other with conventional weapons, mm -hmm. it, it won't change. It, it's good that they're gone. I mean, this is a weapon we've been in the process of getting rid of, rid of all around the world. And uh, there's nothing, nothing bad about getting rid of chemical weapons, but I don't think it solves the problem. China, what role China as we speak? There's a lot of talk about Pakistan and India being the counterweight in our relations with China. Well, the Indians and the Chinese have always been rivals. And um, we, um, I think we have a good relationship with India. And we try to have a good relationship with China. But I mean, they are a competitor in a lot of ways. Hopefully, uh, <clears throat> it will be a, a kind of non military competition. But they are building up their military as well. And, and the irony of that is the countries in the area, as the Chinese um, become more assertive, want to be closer to us. <laughs> that is ironic. It is, you know. <clears throat> Vietnam, even Burma, which has been a repressive regime until very recently. recently. Uh, the, the Indians, uh, the Koreans always, and the Japanese all want to be closer to us as a hedge against um, a neighbor that's pretty big and on the move economically and in other ways. So international affairs are always uh, uh, fascinating to watch the uh, the players interact, but the, 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 you know the main goal is to have as peaceful a world as possible, and at least among countries, I think we're in a relatively s stable period. It's this terrorism issue that is really the threat to most of the civilized world, and it can happen anywhere. Look at the Boston Marathon earlier this year. I mean, it's so easy for a handful of fanatics, maybe as few as two. To, uh, to to wreak havoc. That is a very challenging thing to deal with in the in the future. Speaking of challenging, are you going to have a challenging race for re-election? Oh, I'm sure I will. You know, yes. I'm, a, I'm a big target. Uh, you know, in recent years, if you're the leader of one of the two parties in the Senate, you get a bigger race, not an easier race. And I'm, uh, you know, I have my friends around the country, and I have my enemies around the country, and they'll all be. Um, sending their money to one side <laughs> or the other in, in Kentucky. And, and the TV stations will make a lot of money next year. Actually, they're, they're making a pretty good amount of money this year. They are, they are. We're out of time. It is always a pleasure to yeah, have you here. Yeah, good to, good to be here. Thank you for spending time with us. We've been talking with U.S. Senator Mitch McConnell. And that's going to wrap it up for this week's edition of Kentucky Outlook. I'm Barbara Deeb. We're glad you joined us.